The problem with the video instructions or tutorials, screencasts, call them whatever you want, is that they get outdated, probably with the next release and changes in the UI. And the text is the best way to search for the information. With a lot of new tools, and especially with the AI, you can now search within the video for the certain part. But in my situation, Control F, find something on the page. That's the fastest way to find some information. For me, developer relation is that uh, developer experience is this whole experience. Like it's also documentation, technical writing, nurturing and everything, but developer relations is maintaining that relationship with the developers in a bunch of different ways. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Uh, today, I am your host, Laura Vosch. I work uh, in my daily profession at uh, Pranovix, where we build developer portals, um, and I'm your regular host here. Uh, today, I'm only one person, uh, welcoming two of our guests, Katarina Schupe and Kruno Golubic. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Hi. Thanks for having us. Thank you for joining. Both of our guests work at Memgraph, so uh, we are once again meeting colleagues in the podcast. And the reason why I have invited Kruno is very simple, uh, because uh, one of our guests uh, from before, Fabrizio Ferry, when I asked him, well, who would you like to hear talking about themselves on this podcast? Um, he said, I would love to hear from Kruno. And Kruno brought his colleague Katarina as well. Both of you are coming from a little bit of an angle into where you are today. Uh, Katarina, you are currently working in a developer relations role, but I understood that you're coming from a mathematical and computer science background. Yeah, so uh, I joined Memgraph two years ago and I started my journey uh, as an intern here at Memgraph. Uh, so I studied mathematics and computer science and kind of was looking for an internship role. Where should I go next? And uh, I really lo loved graphs. I mean, I know it's a geeky thing to say, an expected way to say since I work in Memgraph, but uh, I was actually working on my master thesis that included theory of graphs. So when I found out about Memgraph, I was so happy to hear that there is a company, creation-based company where I'm living currently, uh, that is actually creating a product, which is a graph database. I was so surprised by that. So uh, having learned that, I decided to apply for the internship. I got it. And the whole internship was kind of already in the developer experience team because we had to build a demo application. Uh, so like my first steps in Memgraph were already kind of developer experience, developer relations. So. Once I got here full time, I decided to stay in that role and I like it and I'm still here. So I think that uh, I can say that it is a really interesting and dynamic job. And was Kruno your mentor? Uh, no, actually Kruno uh, joined later, uh, although he has a much bigger experience in a working world, but uh, I joined before him, just a little bit actually before him. Kruno, you come from a wonder experience. You uh, said you worked as a help desk manager, system administrator, webmaster, project manager, head of a department, courseware author, lecturer, editor, social media manager, and teacher. Uh, that means you've met a lot of people from a lot of uh, perspectives. How did you arrive to Memgraph and, and with what mission? Yeah, you're right. Um, I've been in the IT for uh, quite some long time, I've, uh, more than 25 years. So I've changed a lot of different positions and I've started at entry level jobs. And with years, you know, I've moved forward. Also at the same time, I've enrolled several different colleges, you know, got my BA, MA, my PhD. And during that time, I've, I've seen the best of both worlds. So I have a background in technical science and also in communities and social science. I've met a lot of people and I've seen what are the gaps, what are the bridges that need to be built between the audience that understand the technical terms, definitions, you know, and how to explain them, those terms that come natural to them to the people that are not native in the IT industry. And that's how I uh, got here uh, to Mangrove. You know, uh, for a lot of years, I've been working on those different tasks related either to user support or education. 
but it was never considered, at least for my part and for my employees, uh, that is something like any kind of de developer relations or even technical writing. You know, it was all part of the normal process. If you do something, you do the documentation. If you have something new, you write a blog post, you create a course. It's regardless if it's an online course, if it's a screencast or write a book. So uh, only when I switched to being a contractor and working as a freelancer, I, I started to consider myself to be a technical writer. And from that position, I came to Mangrove when they were searching for technical writers in their team. They wanted to expand. And that's how I got here. And from that time, I, I'm here at Mangrove now for a little bit more than a year and a half. And our team has grown since then a lot. But mm -hmm. I guess we will touch upon that a little bit later. Yeah, and just wanted to add that uh, we were so happy I was there when there weren't any technical writers in the Memgraph developer experience team. And like we were the technical writers and we aren't ones. So there was me and one another colleague who were DevRels and we were maintaining everything and built it from the bottom up. But of course, it wasn't something that was, I mean, it was readable, but it wasn't something that was perfect for uh, users. So we were so happy to have Kruna join us and another technical writer, Lasta, because I think they totally changed the documentation, uh, improved it. And now uh, I also learned from them how to transfer the message to the user better. And with their reviews, I think that I became also better in technical writer writing, although I'm not like my role is not primarily technical writing. Yeah. And when we have now mentioned Velasta, you know, she she is the heart and the soul of technical documentation at the moment in Mangrove. Uh, she is the one that gives the tone of voice and does all of the polishing. And uh, I've taken more of the role uh, of keeping up with some technical aspects of uh, documentation, you know, the platform where we are publishing and stuff like that. And of course, uh, since Katarina was there before me, uh, she is helping me, you know, if things get stuck with our application that we are using, because um, this might sound strange, but I work as a DevRel. I'm in the developer experience department, but never in my lifetime I worked as a developer. So I, I know how to code some things, but I would never dare to say, oh, I'm a developer, you know. So this is a great thing that our uh, DevX or DevRel team um, covers all of the areas. So we have a professor of English language, we have developers, uh, some have the background in mathematics, other have in the business economy field and stuff like that. So it is rather a nice mix of, people working together to make the best thing, the best product that developers want to use. Where is the line in the sand? Like, what is the moment when you would say somebody is definitely a developer? Does this even exist? This is a pretty interesting topic. I could say on my side, at least, because uh, when I joined, I was always aiming for that thing to say, okay, I am a software engineer, I'm a developer and so on. But the internal side of me that has always taken notes on classes was the one who had the best notes, was the one who always wanted to explain everything to everyone when I knew something. I wanted to give like the easiest possible approach to something. And then I was happy when I would see like sparkles in their eyes and saying, oh, I know I get it. Uh, and I just like that feeling. So, I mean, I can always develop and I contribute to our Python uh, client. I'm actually managing that project. Uh, I I'm also contributing to our uh, graph algorithms library with some utility modules, so mostly in Python. But And I can say, okay, I'm a developer, but uh, I think that I'm uh, more proud of the fact that I can also write documentation, that I can also talk with people, uh, communicate with them, uh, see what are their, uh, what are their pain points uh, with our product and see how I can improve that. So I like this whole... I like this whole uh, picture of developer experience, and I don't think it's necessary to say, okay, I'm exclusively a developer or not. Uh, I think it's fine if we just say, okay, we are developer experience, and we do stuff to make it easier for developers to adopt our product. Uh, but yeah, I can also say I'm a developer. I don't mind whatever role someone 
sticks to my name and says, okay, you are this, you are that. You are one day you are a developer, one day you are not. <laughs> and it's, I think it's totally fine. Uh, it's just, uh, we don't have, I think in our team, any issues with that, with uh, that kind of stuff, like who's who, who's doing the what, like everyone is doing whatever they can regarding their skills. And no one minds like if it's going to be more developed or fast or not. So it's not like we don't have that kind of issues, I would say, within team. And whoever wants to do more developer stuff, they can always jump in the projects that are more programming related and say, okay, I'll do it. And everyone will say, okay, just do it. It's like, we don't mind. You can do it. It's fine. <laughs> we will leave it to you. So yeah, there is no... A fine line in a mem graph, I would say maybe just with the core developers because they are like they are developers dot. But uh, we always also try to get the most out of them regarding documentation. So that that's maybe uh, sometimes the hard part, but uh, I think they are learning too. Because you also, you know, when you're working as a dev or something and you're working on the documentation, often you need code examples or you want to create a demo app you know want to show how to use something how to connect to some api how to access the application and then you need a programming code i don't know in python or c++ or something like that and this is a good thing if you have a, a real good developer on on your team and we are lucky to have them you know i would i would dare to say at the moment if i'm not mistaken we are six so there are there is six of us in the team and i would dare to say that three of them are developers two two of us we are more uh, documentation oriented and we have uh, one new uh, student that have joined us recently and she is at the moment community oriented and this is this is a good thing you know because we can we can cover a lot of different things you know and regarding our team, what I really, really like is the fact that we have grown over the last, uh, past year and a half, you know, and as uh, Katarina has mentioned, she was the intern. And what I like about it that next year, one year after she got, she became the mentor to a few students and we have hired one of those students to our team, you know, and this is great. This means that, you know, she, she is at the moment passing on her knowledge to the next generation, the next generation of the students. And some of those students come then and, and work for us. So this is, this is the developer experience, you know, because you get a, for example, a student comes fresh out of the university to you. Uh, he know, has, or she has some skills regarding some tools and it's time to get on hands-on projects. How is it, is it to onboard with this new product? How is it to integrate it into the other systems? And when you come to work as an intern, you uh, go through all of that process by yourself with the help of your mentor. And this is also a point where we can see a lot of things that needs to be updated or upgraded or, or improved. So this mentorship also, it proves both people that come to work for us, we hope one day, but it also improves our product because we see the real life scenarios. Sometimes when you're working on a product, you're too close to it. Oh, it's so obvious that some things should be done in a certain way, but only a fresh pair of eyes, and especially from students that want to dig, that want to understand each aspect, each dot, you know, why is it here? That's that's what then makes the difference and helps us to improve our documentation or the workflow that we present to developers. Yeah, and I think yeah. that uh, it's a good thing that you mentioned the new set of eyes. Uh, we have a, like a big Discord community. Uh, and uh, since Nungraph is open source, we have a bunch of people joining, trying it out for their own projects and I don't know, whatever they need, they ask there. And it's a great thing that since they are open source community, they are often saying, oh, you have a typo here, typo there. I think this could be better. Maybe if you try to do it like this and they have a suggestions for our documentation, uh, I must say they often say it's awesome. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a fact, but yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, so it's nice to hear kind words from people from the community, but also 
from them having advices on what can be improved and then them seeing how we incorporate that feedback feedback like in five minutes it's up and they're like what's happening so mm -hmm. they are so happy to see that uh, we do listen to them because we do believe in developer experience that that the experience of the developer is the most important thing so if, if the steps are not clear to uh, to an average developer to go through it and we want someone to use a product that is a totally new thing to them then we are not doing it right so it's our fault it's not the developer's fault it's not they are not crazy like they are not seeing the steps clearly we didn't explain it good enough so we are always improving that stuff especially uh since we are a database like import is the most important stuff recently we just we just removed everything we had because we saw the flow is totally wrong like people came to our site they want to import data we said okay what kind of data they want to import so first they would say okay this is file format that i have we didn't have it like that before we had the totally wrong flow and then we decided to start from scratch take the parts that we have and just realign everything in the right order and in the end I think that adoption was much better because we uh, we just decided to go with the flow like some developer would go when they have data they want to import. And that is hard. I mean, it, it sounds like a simple thing, like it's the simplest thing, like I want to import my data, but it's not, when you start to write it, it's really not that simple and uh, things can get complicated in so many ways. And you can have like on documentation, you have like a link to one page, link to another page, this links back to the first one. And then you get all messed up in those links and nothing makes sense anymore. So we just need to be careful about the content, about linking, uh, the whole flow. Uh, and this is just for one sub page on our documentation. So, yeah. Yeah, and some time ago, we, we actually scanned all of our pages. And at the moment, our documentation is, uh, I think, about 600 pages long, you know. So there is a lot of info in it. And it has to be maintained and kept up to date with uh, every new release, every new feature, every new algorithm that we implement so that people know, oh, now we can do this. What is it that you have in your circle of responsibility. So the 600 pages of docs, yeah. And um, you mentioned blog posts. Are you part of marketing? Is marketing separate from you? How is the setup? What other teams do you work with? Uh, so uh, we are technically uh, part of marketing, but uh, I mean, we are like a separate team on the outside mm -hmm. developer experience, but we are, um, we are related with marketing. We have a meeting together. We are tightly related. We try to track what is out there and what do people search for? What do people want? Of course, that content has to be connected with us tightly because when we write a blog post, it is important that we write on topics that are important and that uh, we are writing something that is going to be useful to the users. So we are like tightly connected with marketing. We don't have such hierarchies uh, that are that's strictly defined, uh, but we do have a lot of meetings together on a daily basis and a weekly basis. So uh, we do communicate a lot with uh, marketing, but we also do communicate a lot with product. Uh, it's important that uh, whatever whatever feature request, bug fix, uh, bug issue, anything we get, we need to make sure that it's being properly reported to product and that we do push on those features that are um, that are important to the community that we feel like, okay, this is something that is really good for the product. We saw it, people are asking for it. It seems like important in this, this stage of a developer. And uh, in the end, it gets inside the product. And I would say that well, that is maybe the most rewarding thing for me when I see that, I don't know, I was saying it was so strong, but we need to have this, we need to have that, and we need, yeah, it's in the product, and I'm so happy to tell to the users, oh, uh, the feature you requested is finally out. So, yeah, it's kind of cross-team developer experience, I think, in many companies, as far as I heard it, because I listened to a bunch of podcasts on that topic, so also yours. Uh, I know that our developer experience is... Um, a mix of uh, different skills, but also mix of communication with our other teams. Uh, and we do have an impact on uh, many teams. So it's a bit hard to define strict lines between teams and hierarchies. 
uh, yeah, so I know it's not a simple answer. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a simple situation with developer experience. I think never. But yeah, regarding uh, our responsibilities, so I'm mostly creating uh, demos. I'm working on uh, blog posts. I'm also presenting on uh, different meetups and conferences. I create workshops, and like Bruno mentioned, I most often reuse them for. Uh, internships for some kind of onboarding sessions for them and uh, yeah also managing uh, our titan client uh, i think this is uh, one of the project that is uh, maybe most valuable to me because it was my first uh, true python project when i joined uh, memgraph and i got a chance to run it now and uh, also regarding the doc side uh, it uh, had to be well aligned with documentation too because we had an issue that uh, memgraph documentation we wanted to uh, hold uh, whole information about our python client as a separate section and the question was how to document um, this whole client uh, in one way while we had the documentation for the whole database in a totally different way like it, for the database we are writing everything in markdown we are generating it we have a docosaurus uh, website uh, and for gql alchemy our python client uh, we have a code so how to document all of that stuff in like a similar way so that documentation has a good flow uh, we ended up doing uh, like uh, doc strings for uh, all of our code we needed to keep that uh, in line we needed to make it uh, uh, we needed to follow a certain standard and in the end generate uh, documentation markdown from that we used pydoc markdown uh, and add that in our documentation. And this was kind of a totally new process for us. It was a whole new uh, project that uh, that was created when I joined. So uh, currently, I would say the only, uh, the next step that I would like to have is to automate everything that I said. It's currently not automated. So whenever there is a new release of our client, we need to again generate uh, new docs and then put it on our documentation so this is currently something that is uh, kind of my pain point uh, and i would love to have it um, better aligned better organized but uh, i think um, just because we wanted to put it on our website of documentation it was a bit harder if you decided to just leave it as it is since it's a python code python client let people read there on github it would be much easier but I believe that it's better if we try a bit harder and uh, write a couple of how-to guides and tutorials and so on for the usage. But yeah, a lot of mix of a uh, lot of different duties uh, in the team. Bruno, why do you have a linguist on the team? Professor of English language, so yeah. that uh, the documentation is perfect. We are a startup. We are actually a London-based uh, startup, and uh, there is a bunch of us working from all over the world. You know, most of us are located here in Croatia, and although we all have, I would say, good and great English skills, you know, when it comes to certain finances uh, and small things in the language, it is good to have a professional on the team who knows those subtle differences. Uh, when it comes, you know, to ad addressing your audience in the in the right way, and the good thing about it is that Vlasta she is uh, at the same time professor of uh, IT science and English language and literature. So this is uh, the best mix uh, for this type of position, you know, when it comes to writing and editing or reviewing uh, the documentation. And in your daily work as a technical writer now, do you see your prior experiences coming back saying hello, where you do something that would maybe not be so intuitive for someone who always was in technical writer roles? Yeah, I would say because I come from this education background, you know, where I was teaching the IT courses to people that with no IT skills and all the way to the professionals, you know, when I was teaching Microsoft certified courses. So I've seen what kind of difference does the your background in the IT means, you know, it's totally different how to approach someone who is actually seeing the computer for the first time and ordering the system administrator how to set up a new server. And because of that, uh, I have this ability to put myself in the role of a totally new user, somebody who has never seen the system before, you know, and I try to walk through the documentation or write the documentation in the way 
to answer the questions that such user would ask, you know. And this is why uh, out of all of the forms of the documentation, uh, I mostly like, and those are my favorite, are actually screencasts or videos. Uh, because when you record a video and you show the user what to do, where to click, and there is no way that the uh, user can skip a step, you know. They can pause mm -hmm. the video, see, oh, this button was clicked, or that option was changed, or the code needs to be entered here. But the problem with the video instructions or tutorials, screencasts, call them whatever you want, is that they get outdated, probably mm -hmm. with the next release and changes in the UI, you know. And the text is the best way... Uh, to search for the information, you know, with, with a lot of new tools, and especially with the AI, you can now search within the video for the certain part. But, you know, uh, in my situation, control F, find something on the page. That's that's the fastest way to find some, some information. So um, I think that uh, there is more, much, much more to technical writing than just pure writing, you know, the, the very act of uh, putting the words on, in, onto the keyboard. It is also thinking about uh, how each user would approach this problem, uh, how to guide that person, what, what to show, what to omit, you know. Sometimes you want your documentation to look like a picture book, but other times uh, it, is, uh, it is not something that one would expect. And this is also where we come a lot, uh, to work with other teams because a lot of times we are actually QA. We are the ones who see the product maybe the first besides the development team we, because you need to write the documentation about the new feature. So you have to test out everything and then maybe you see some kind of uh, flaw in the logic, in the workflow. Where should something go? Where should be omitted? And also when it comes to UI, you know, a good UI is the one that you don't need to explain. When your user knows where to click, what action will be completed. And there is no uh, sense, you know, in describing everything in the documentation. Oh, we have 25 buttons on this page and describe what each button does. It should be safe explanatory. And we have a great UI and UX team. So we don't do explanations of such nature in our documentation. Because if it's not clear from the UI, then it is not a good UI and it needs to be needs to be changed. Yeah, and it's a great thing since we are not that large, uh, still not that large, that uh, we can just say to our UX designer and look, Ana Maria, she is called. We can tell her, hi, Ana Maria, look, this could be better. Like, we don't have to say, okay, we need to document this card. We need to work on this card to explain it to the users. No, we go straight to the UX and say, look, this isn't good. We need to make it better. It's not clear enough. And then we fix like the root cause and not trying to do just our thing on the docs to make it explainable. And you connected that with not being a large company yet. Why do you think uh, that uh, such directness is only possible in a small company? Well, I'm not sure since this is my first work experience, but I would say, like, in my opinion, that uh, we are quite close to each other. We are good colleagues. We know each other. There is like 30 of us and we all know each other by name. We know who we are, what are our hobbies. And uh, there is uh, usually one person who is dedicated to one part of the um, work that we do. So, for example, in the UX, we have Ana Maria. We know she is the one who is the who is working on UX, and since she's like almost the only one working on that, she's always asking for a feedback from her colleagues, and this is all of us. So it's not like just within one team for the product that she's working on. It's like from everyone. What do you think? She holds like this whole. Uh, meetings with us and so on so when she asked me for her feedback then I'm always uh, like open to tell her whatever I like whatever I think it's not good and it's easy because I just have to tell this information to this one person and this one person also fixes it so it's not like I'm telling this to her and she has to spread it out to 10 more people and then these 10 people have to decide whether they should do it or not so the decision is made automatically then and there so when I tell it to her, she says to me, 
okay, that's better, or no, I won't do it because this way is better. And I know what's going to happen. So I like it that way, and I think it's a it's a quick development. And uh, I mean, there are different approaches to that, but for now, it proved good for us because we have bug fixes and everything done much sooner because of that, because we are listening to each other and we are receiving feedback constantly and people are improving things whenever those things are said to them without asking for approval out of 10 other people. Have you seen it played out differently, Kruno? Well, when when it comes to, I wouldn't say perhaps bigger companies where I've worked, but companies that are organized in more hierarchical and bureaucratic way, you can say that, uh, that there is a problem when you need like six or seven people to sign off on some change to get it published, you know. Mm-hmm. And that is a problem because you can have the best co-workers and if on the step five somebody says, no, we won't implement this and it ends with, we want to implement this you don't need to know why it's not your job, then people can be demotivated, you know, because you're providing a feedback, you're trying to do something and something gets stopped and you don't know why it didn't go through. Uh, We are, as uh, Katerina has said, we are about 30 people now. So we are not a big company. We, each of us has its own responsibilities. We have our own backyards, our playgrounds, you know, we have our pet projects, we have everything. Uh, But uh, you know that every feedback that you provide or you are asked to provide feedback for something is uh, for a reason. It is not uh, a pure form because some project manager has said that you must have a discovery session and you must fill out this form and click all of the check boxes, you know, cross all teeth, dot all eyes, you know, it's it's not because of that. It has a purpose, and the purpose is to complete development cycle, to push out new features, do a triage of requests that we have from the users, which things should we implement first. You know, that that is why I think that is much, much easier in the smaller company. What I like about it is that fit well together, you know, we are from all over the globe. And you cannot see that uh, that any type of difference in a work ethics or a work culture. Uh, so we just fit together very well. I must say that our, I guess, our HR and our team leads are doing a great job when they are hiring people because they find a part, they find that missing puzzle that we need at this time for certain position or something and then find the person that fits perfectly and this is this is why a smaller team at the moment is a good thing i would i would say and i especially like the part that you mentioned regarding motivation uh because i think that's a pretty good thing since uh, i think in that way everyone has a, like a feeling like they are contributing to the product so if we return back to whether you are a developer or not in membra for example it really doesn't matter because uh, you can contribute in the same way that someone from the core team can. Everything has its value and everything is like everything uh, is being appreciated. So whenever you get, gave a feedback and it goes into production, everyone is happy. You are happy. You are motivated that your suggestion made it. So I think that it's a good thing for the team that everyone feels like they can contribute regardless of their background, regardless of their developer skills and so on. You mentioned that you had two interns to tutor or mentor. Um, in your internship program, I, I assume they were interns for your developer relations team or were they uh, interns for the marketing team or were they interns for the company? How specific you are with the internship programs in a company of 30? Uh, So we usually hold like two types of internships. Uh, So one type is led by developer experience team. Last year, it was me. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this project is kind of create a demo application. Uh, We decided on this approach. So it's not something like be a developer experience team in a day-to-day job but it's rather project based where you get to learn. It's like a quick onboarding. Mm-hmm. It's two months of uh, learn a mem graph, learn how to connect to it and create a demo application showcasing its strengths. 
And in that way, we see how is someone doing with graphs. We see how is someone uh, with their developer skills. We can see through that if someone is leaning more towards, okay, I want to make the best readme ever. I want to, you have a mistake there in docs. Okay, let me do a PR and fix it. We see all of those little things uh, in the intern. And in the end, the intern gets this whole application that they can show to the world. And we also get a demo application. And in the end, like Runa mentioned, we also got a new employee, Mata, who proved to be, of course, awesome. And we were happy to see her progress through the internship uh, and end up as a valuable member of our team. The other internship was in the whole other team. Uh, it's more, um, it's a bit lower level development. So it's not like web app. It's like working on our libraries. Uh, so this is kind of, it has a bit of different requirements. We look for the students that are uh, more into coding, not that interested in this whole developer experience things. Uh, not that into web apps, but more into, I don't know, C++, Python development. And um, in the end, they all have their own presentations and projects. So they also stay to work with us in different teams. Uh, but they also have a project-based uh, internship where they have to, in the end, create a new procedure or something like that within that library. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, I'm not sure whether that's... Um, like I know that some bigger companies, maybe it's not related to the size of the company, but I know that they sometimes have interns that join the company and they become the part of the day-to-day -day jobs and they get assigned to a certain project with their mentor where their mentor is. But that's kind of hard for us because if I'm doing like this and this and that one day on this and this and that, and it's a bit hard to... Uh, then say, okay, let's bring an intern here and can you jump on 20 different things uh, in a week? Uh, but it's easier to say, okay, just let's come, let's do the onboarding, we'll let you learn everything you can and then you decide which direction you will take within the company uh, which suits the best because we don't want to end up with uh, uh, someone who is not satisfied with where they're at. Like, it's important to for them to get to know each other. We get to know each other from that internship experience. Uh, we get mm -hmm. to see what are their advantages, disadvantages, and what they like the most and where they maybe see themselves. At the end of the internship, they always get asked, like, which team would you like to be in? Like, it doesn't matter if you are on an internship in developer experience team, you get asked, okay, maybe you would like to be a part of the core team. Um, but usually, my experience so far was that people would love to stay in the team that they were assigned to in the beginning. Uh, I guess they like the internship, I don't know. But this was the case uh, with uh, me and with uh, my intern, and we'll see about this year. And this internship thing is also one of the things that DevRel does. So when we have... Uh, job fairs or uh, such type of events on university here in Zagreb, we go there and there is always somebody from the DevRel team and somebody from the team that is looking for the interns. So the interns can talk on the place, you know, with a member of the core team or with a member of a uh, mage team or whatever team is looking for new interns so they can talk directly with them and see who their co-workers or mentors will be so they don't get surprised you know when they come to work and say oh but this is not what i've signed up for so you when you apply for your internship you know the direction that you want to go into and you have opportunity to talk with persons before jumping in and starting to work with us what is your experience in a developer relations team? What specific role do you need to explain the most in 2023 to your interns? What is the, I have no idea what this role does. Is there such? Do you still have to explain what a technical writer does? Or that's already known at this point? Uh, I would say um, Kruno can say about technical writer, he probably... Uh 
talks with more people about that. But whenever I say develop relations, it's still hard to explain. Uh, it's not hard to explain on my side, but people are always asking like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not clear to them at first, uh, especially not to the students. Uh, I would say developer experience, like a team, is much more clear to them. Uh, it's like they get it. Like you have experience, experience with a product. We are developers experience with our product. They kind of, okay, okay, I get it. So, and then I usually say a sentence, okay, but we try to explain to a developer um, which, which steps do they have to take or the most easiest adoption of our product. Like we need to uh, figure out what is the best experience for the developers using our product. And this is why we are developer experience. But developer relations is kind of, I see it as a bit of like a, a subset maybe of maintaining a relationship with the community, with the developers that are inside our community and nurturing that relationship. And uh, that part is kind of, something that it's always mixing with the community uh, and uh, something that it doesn't have, they still doesn't have a clear lines on what, who does what and what are the uh, stuff that are included inside. But what I usually say is that you have to, like developers that work with the product you work for have to matter to you. So you have to, you have to have like a passion of helping them if you are a developer relations, developer relations engineer, whatever role, you have to have a passion to help them. You need to listen to them. You need to listen to their problems and you need to find a solution to their problems. Uh, and they need to see that effort uh, because in that way they will like the product more. And that is a fact. Like I notice it in my conversations with the community, people appreciate that you are trying to help them. And people appreciate when they see changes being made upon their uh, feedback. So mm -hmm. I would say for me, developer relation is that uh, developer experience is this whole experience. Like it's also documentation, technical writing, uh, nurturing and everything. But developer relations is maintaining that relationship with the developers in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, I like to build up on what Katarina said. There is also this term developer advocate. You know, and this is what we really are. We advocate for the needs of the developers within the company because we are the front line. We are the first face, the first persons the developers see. Our product, the documentation, videos, meetups, talks and conferences, or even this podcast. For a lot of people, this would be the first time that they hear or see Mangrove. They want to learn more about it. They come to you, they approach you on Meetup and they ask you, can I do this? Can, will you implement this feature, that feature? You get the new ideas and then you have to advocate for them. So those features would get accepted and uh, embedded into our product, you know? So we are the link, we are the bridge between the developer community and our developers that are developing the product for that, for that community. Uh, when it comes to the explaining what do we do and all of those terms, uh, if I look locally, for example, here in Croatia, term technical writing, uh, developer advocate, developer relations is something that I would dare to say didn't exist one or two years ago. You know, if you were looking for job ads, you would never find such a clear uh, description. We are looking for a technical writer. But you would find we are looking for a developer that will maintain our documentation, that will keep updated, or we are looking for a person that will present our product somewhere. But the, the term itself, technical writing, is rather new, you know, because it was like, okay, so you're a developer, you have written this code, so just go ahead and document it. And not everybody likes to write the documentation. Everybody loves to read a good documentation and to have a good documentation when when they need it. But this is a good thing uh, that developer uh, developers can now rely on technical writers who will help them form those documents that have started working on or have finished in such way that uh, it will be easier for them, you know, to focus on developing the product and leave the technical writing to somebody else, you know, who is expert in, in that field. 
but uh, those are our pretty new fields, I would say, at least here in Croatia. Outside, I would say they are much, much more often meet, especially technical writing. It is something that has been here for decades, but it is often mixed with other terms like uh, documentarian, you know, uh, knowledge creator, somebody who takes uh, care of all of the archive of all of the materials and knowledge that are being created within uh, a company. So there is a lot, a lot of different terms that I've met during my work career. And then it is also how I ended up calling myself a technical writer. You know, when, when you take a look what you have done during past five or 10 years, and then you say, well, yeah, this seems like a technical writing, but just nobody has told you that you were actually a technical writer for, for the past 10 years. Yeah, and also to add to that, I think that... Uh as mentioned, like developer relations and experience always existed, even if it didn't have like a name or a certain role, I think it always existed because there were always people in the company who cared about those things that are important to others, other developers, and they were maybe pushing it harder into that direction. Uh, and I love it that there is such role because I totally think uh, it, it is my role. And I don't know if I didn't fit into this role, I would probably, be, I don't know, developer somewhere, but like the role also, like not, not on purpose. I wouldn't maybe know that it's a role. I would just probably do it, you know, like uh, go to Stack Overflow and see, oh, someone is asking this question about our product that we're working on. Let me answer that. Or, oh, we have a Discord community. Let me be part of that uh, and so on. So I think that it's something that comes naturally to some people. I would be happy if it comes naturally to everyone in our company, but it's not like that, of course. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a good thing that now I think as far as I can see, it is becoming uh, more and more uh, popular and adopted. And I hope that one day, like, I don't know in how many years, if I tell it to my friends, like I'm a developer relations engineer, they'll go, oh, nice. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know what they do, but still no. <laughs> the the biggest stigma that i think this developer relations uh, has on it is when people don't know what exactly developer relation team or does they think oh so you're actually selling you're trying to convince other developers to use your product no that's not that it's same as developer relations regarding the communication across the all of platforms oh so you're like uh, uh, managing a community on social networks, your community manager. No, it's not exactly like that, but it incorporates those tasks, you know, because we have a huge uh, community on the Discord. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. We can see people ask a bunch of questions on Stack Overflow. We can see people asking us, pinging us directly over the social network. So we are we are monitoring all of those channels but it is not the same role as one would say is, I don't know if you're uh, working on a help desk or if you're a community manager for social media and stuff like that. This is a fine difference. To be a good DevRel, you must know your product inside out. There is no script. You cannot have like 10 most frequently asked questions that you can just say out loud. You need to understand the product, the problems that developers are encountering you must know how to approach them and how to debug them how to get more information how to formulate the requests that you will pass on to the internal developers that will work then on those issues Katarina, you mentioned that uh, the next step where you want to push yourself professionally within MGraph is to automate the, the, the two documentation creation pathways. What is this for you, Nacrono? Where where is the edge for you? Where are you where are you pushing yourself as a technical writer? So okay. as a technical writer, uh, I'm mostly now working. I want to go back to those technical skills that I have, you know, with my background in system administration and everything. So I'm moving more towards the uh, maintenance of our platform that we are using, incorporating new features into it. So this is the part that I'm working. And at the moment, I'm brushing up on my Docker skills. 
just recently we have released a mangrove docker extension so i was the one taking care of that process you know with help of our developers this was my first encounter with creating a docker extension so i would say i'm going a little bit back more towards the technical skills i'm moving away from the writing and creating the documentation lately i've been working mostly on the blog posts on the technical topics this is the direction that i'm going at the moment here at Mangra. And you see this as a typical next step for other tech writers? I would say it all depends from where you are coming from. I see it like this. I had, first, I had a technical background. I've worked as a system administrator for 10 years. Then I started working in education and I started passing on my knowledge to others. And when the mouse would broke down, I would have to call, uh, call IT help desk and tell them, oh, bring me a new mouse. You know, I've, I've moved away from the system administration. And, uh, but I love working with the people. And now I love, uh, the technical writing is a great way to spread your knowledge. You write something and dozens and hundreds of people can read it. And if they find it useful, you will help them with their problem, you know. So for me, it was, I was starting at technical. I went into the social and humanity sciences. Now I'm going back again towards the technical. Why? Because I see that in our field, in the IT, you have to learn the whole time. You have to keep an eye on trends. You have to watch out for the new technologies. Otherwise, you will get overrun. And now I think it's time for me to brush up again on the technical skills and then bring it back into the this part of technical writing and transferring knowledge again. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is like somebody starts as a developer, at one point they want to become a project manager because they don't want to code anymore. They want to lead people, they want to transfer their knowledge to others to show them the right way to do things. And other people just want to code. And that's fine because everybody has something that keeps them motivated. And for me, that is transferring, passing on my knowledge to others. That's what keeps me happy. Thank you very much uh, for uh, being the guests at the podcast and for sharing how you see your roles and, and where do you see that going as a technical writer member and a developer relations engineer of a developer experience team. And I'm really wondering where you're going, because as all startups, I assume that you're going to soon experience some rapid growth and that changes uh, the dynamics. So I hope to hear from you like in about a year or two and hear how that changed. Where did your role shift? Um, where is your attention shifting? How are your communication patterns shifting? Like for me, that's fascinating. And probably for a lot of people from their own point of view, it's interesting to hear what's, what's the next step what is coming and and how to navigate that so thank you again uh, for being the guest and yeah hear from you soon thank you thank you for inviting us and i hope that we get to be guests in two years again and talk more yeah thank you laura thank you for listening to the api the docs podcast we thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this, and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.